Welcome. It's January. Um, and we are doing our second, it seems strange. This is technically our second kind of part of the city's Trojan Head 2.0 cohort, which seems odd because we had our first one in September. <laughs> but in the meantime, we um, invited um, City's Charging Ahead 2.0 folks in November to the dealership meeting, which I think was really, really good. Um, uh, and, I don't know. Yeah. And can folks mute if they're, try to mute yourself um, as we go here, and then we'll give you a chance to unmute. Um, and so um, there's, so we had that, and then we had all the webinars in the beginning of December. And so it just, just, it seemed like we should just wait till January for this fleet session. And we have great sessions. We have amazing speakers. I'm super excited. Um, and, and I wanna say just a couple of things I've been thinking about. You know, we applied for funding to do these sets, this cohort to really help cities get across the finishing line on some of these pieces, the charging in September, fleets now, and then I'll have an announcement about, we do have dates set for kind of the EV readiness standards, EV ready community or cities um, in February. But, you know, help us help you, tell us what you need to get across the finish line. We really wanna help you get to action. You know, the first cities charging ahead was a lot about the, the um, education, um, and, you know, we're really interested now in educating you also, but really getting you across the finish line, helping you get there. So um, I just wanted to put that out there. I've been thinking about that. So I wanted to put that out there. So um, without further ado, um, Chris, um, are we doing the poll after the icebreakers, during the icebreakers? Uh, I thought it would be after. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Sorry. Okay, so introductions. As you know, I love icebreakers. So here, here is the, the icebreaker. Um, as always, your name, your city or organization and title. And the icebreaker is, would you rather live where it only snows? I had no idea it was going to snow today when I did this two weeks ago. <laughs> or um, where the temperature never falls before below 100 degrees. Um, so I'll start and then as I usually do, I'll call people and call people on deck just to make this go smoothly. Um, my name is Diana McEwen. I direct the Metro Region of CERTS at the Great Plains Institute and get to be your MC for these reindeer games. And if you know me, you know my answer to this. I would be happy to be somewhere where the temperature never falls below 100 degrees. I would like for there to be a lake or an ocean near me, but that is what I would choose. Um, hands down. So um, we will go Chris Acuna and then Lynn is next on deck. Hi everyone, my name is Chris Acuna. I'm uh, with the Great Plains Institute. I'm a program associate on the communities team. Um, I'm sure you're all very familiar with me at this point. Um, so I, this is actually kind of tough. I hate being really hot. Um, and snow isn't that bad as long as it's like not negative 20 all the time. But I feel like if you've lived in 100 degree weather, you, my girlfriend's from California and she swears it's really nice all the time to be warm. So I might have to go where it never falls below 100 degrees because this winter has been long and it's not, it's not over yet. <laughs> no, it's barely begun. <laughs> um, it, it, thank you, Chris. Um, and then before Lynn goes, thank you, Lynn, for turning on your camera. Please, if you can, turn on your camera. We really like to see you put a name and a face together. Um, all right, Lynn and then Jack. Hi, this is Lynn Arninger with the City of Red Wing, uh, Deputy Director of Public Services. And I would say snow. Oops. Not surprising for a Minnesotan. <laughs> <laughs> Minnesotan. Yes. Yeah, all right, awesome. And feel free to just turn on your video now, like everybody, so we can see each other. Like, go ahead and ah, let me see the faces. Yes, <laughs> they're all magically coming on. Okay, so who did I say? I said Jack was next. Now my, my um, it's changing. So Jack, then Story. 
This is Jack Redden. I am an AmeriCorps member uh, serving with the city of Woodbury. Uh, my title is I'm a Community Forestry Corps member, so I work a lot with trees, but I've been working on some climate, mostly climate things uh, with some of the members from Woodbury. And I would, I would go with snow. Um, haven't gotten enough of it, so. <laughs> well, you live in the right place. Are you from Minnesota? I'm from Madison, Wisconsin, but I've been living oh, here for five same years. Same thing. So. Yeah. <laughs> same difference. All right. Um, and welcome. You know, Woodbury has been a long time. Jen's a really good friend, so happy to have you with us. So Story and then Rebecca. Hi, I'm Story. I am, she or hers, I am the Green Corps member serving the uh, city of Golden Valley. And um, I absolutely would pick snow. I despise summer. I think it's gross and should go away. I don't want to ever have to wear shorts ever again. I only ever want to have to wear like corduroy overalls, like <laughs> ideal outfit. That sounds like a great time. I, I'm a huge skier. I love cross country. I love, I'm a big downhill racer. Sounds like a great time for it to be snowing all the time. Okay. I wanted to like you. And then <laughs> you said that, but then you said corduroy overalls. So we're good. Yeah. Um, so Rebecca and then Melissa. Hello, I am Rebecca Heisel, the Minnesota Green Corps member serving with GPI on their communities team. And this was actually really hard for me. It kind of caused like an identity crisis because I do really like, I prefer summer and the warmth, but like 100 degrees is a little excessive for me. So I, I think I really have to go with the snow, which is a little upsetting, but going with the snow. Yeah, Sophie's choice. Okay, so um, thank you, Rebecca, Melissa, and then Andrew. Good morning, everyone. I'm Melissa Bartman with the City of Red Wing Community and Economic Development Coordinator and also staff liaison to the Sustainability Commission. And it is hard to decide, but I'm going to say the heat. Um, I don't think I could handle snow every day. Right, exactly. Thanks, Melissa. Andrew and then Matt Miller. Hi, I'm Andrew Boucher with the city of Shakopee. And I don't know, it's a really hard one because I guess I've seen Minnesotans act like it's winter or summer when in the middle of winter. So I'd say snow because I mean, we spend half the year with it anyway. Oh God, don't say half the year. It's, it's six months one way or the other. Okay, shh. <laughs> it's also really cool to see all the Green Corps and AmeriCorps Corps members uh, representing today. For sure. All right. Matt Miller, then Annie. Good morning. I'm Matt Miller. I'm Director of Facilities and Building Operations with Olmstead County, and I would definitely pick snow. So you can always add layers when it's cold out. Once you get above 100, you can only take off so many layers, right? Uh, the other advantage to snow is no mosquitoes, uh, gnats, horse flies, all those other things that tend to bother you in the heat. So are you trying to persuade the others to go your, like, are you debate? Is this, are you making a persuasion? What's going on here? <laughs> trying. We are in Minnesota, right? Yeah. Some of us just were born here and just didn't belong, but okay. Annie and then Anthony. Hi everyone. I'm Annie Potter and I'm a sustainability specialist with the city of St. Louis Park. And I would also have to go with snow. I didn't grow up um, in Minnesota or with snow and I love having the four distinct seasons. And so I think I would just have to go with that option. All right. I feel like we, we really only have two seasons, you know, and that winter is like finter in the fall and sprinter in the spring, but yes. Anthony and then Drew. Hey everyone, I'm Anthony. Um, I'm also a Minnesota Green Corps member serving with the Leech Lake Band of Ojibwe. Um, and I would have to go with snow just because I like to have my window open when I sleep. And if it's like super hot out, then I, that's going to make it harder to actually fall asleep. Um, and I like to ski, but, and, but when I think about it, window open while it's snowing might be too cold, but I think I would prefer that over the, the heat, you know? So. It is true that studies say we sleep better when we're colder than warmer. So Drew and then Shane, I'm trying to convince my daughter because I, often turn the heat super far down or even off completely upstairs and she's like it's cold I'm like it's better for sleep. Drew Morning. and then Shane. 
Yeah, yeah Drew Warren. Larson with Rochester oh, Public yeah. Utilities. Oh, there's two Drews. Two Drews. Oh, there is two. So rare. Wow. Go ahead, Larson. Go ahead. <laughs> Sorry. It's all good. Didn't mean to invade. Um, so I'm going to have to go with Matt uh, on this one and and say it's really hard to take off layers uh, at 100 degrees. So, so I'm going to go with snow. All right. Then the other Drew. Yeah, Drew, Drew EW. Um, I would say it, it's difficult for me, too. I really, I'm with Rebecca, I think it was, who said she doesn't really like the hot. I'm with her on that. I also drive a really small car, so a lot of snow would not be helpful, but I think I'd rather just get a different vehicle, so I would go with snow. All right, then, Shane and then Caitlin. Hi, Shane Steele, City Grand Marais Sustainability Coordinator, and... I'll pick snow, but I think it would be logistically very difficult to live in a place where it's only snowing all the time. So that would be hard to deal with every single day, snowing all the time. <laughs> awesome. Uh, Caitlin, then Jen. Hi, Caitlin Bachland with Great Plains Institute. Um, I would also pick snow. Oh. I think that's surprising to me. I don't know why. We've never talked about this. I Jen, hate heat. Well, but that's also because you put snow tires on your leaf, unlike me. And, you know, that's a struggle. Jen and then Tina. Hi, Jen McLaughlin, City Woodbury Sustainability Specialist. Um, and I also wanted to, you know, I had Jack join me on um, the meeting. He is... Um, really been helping us a lot with some of these climate um, conversations and so I had um, introduced him you know by email to Diana and Abby but um, he'll probably be reaching out to some other people as we get moving forward so I appreciate that he was able to see everybody's face and turn cameras on so thanks. Um, well for me I would have to pick the heat because I do love yeah the sun and everything I'm just hoping the humidity is is not too bad. Got it. All right, Tina. Welcome, Tina. Nice to see you. Tina, then Allie. Hi, nice to see you as well. Um, I am the contracts administrator and purchasing agent for the city of Red Wing, so I get a, a, involved in a lot of the major acquisitions. And so um, I would take the cold. I can't believe I'm saying this, but I love to run uh, long distance, and you can't do that when it's 100 degrees. That's all it comes down to. So uh, yeah, don't quote me on that. I won't put it in writing. Okay. <laughs> yeah, you're not you're not bound to that. All right, Allie and then Shannon. Hi everyone. I'm Allie. I am the environmental specialist for the city of Invergrove Heights. And I definitely would choose the heat, but I would hope that I would be near a water body of some sort. <laughs> so. Same sister. Shannon and then Maria. And Maria doesn't have um, a microphone so she can chat it into the thing. The chat. <laughs> I'm Shannon Reidlinger with the city of Oakdale, uh, and having lived in both the north and the south, I will say I have to choose the cold over the heat. All right, well, you're in the right place. Uh, Maria, she is with the city of Shoreview, and she chooses the heat. There's so many things to do when it's warm, and I like it for my, more for my job as well as for commute. Ooh, one plus hours. Dang, that's a big, long commute. Um, we need to get you in an electric vehicle, uh, a long range one. Um, Kelly, I know you don't have video, but do you have voice? Yeah, can you hear me? We can hear you. Okay, so hi, I'm Kelly Perai, and I'm with the city of Lakeville. I'm the environmental resources technician here, and I would definitely have to choose the heat because I'm surprised that out of all of us environmentalists, no one has mentioned how you can grow plants in the heat. I cannot, like, not have growing plants with the winter, so yeah, got to choose that. And welcome, Kelly. Lakeville is a, an addition. They didn't start off with CCA 2.0 last fall, um, but was really interested in fleets, and I asked her to join our our um, cohort meetings here. So welcome. Happy to have Lakeville with us. Yeah, um, thanks for having us. Absolutely. So, you know, I just saw Paulson pop onto the video, so I'm going to have to pick on John Paulson. Hello, everybody. Uh, yeah, John Paulson with the City of Hutchinson, uh, Project Environmental Regulatory Manager. Uh, I prefer uh, 
I don't want to say heat, but warmth. Yes. Uh, moderate temperatures are perfect for me. That's why I love Minnesota. It's not so crazy hot in the summer and not so, I guess it does get kind of cold, but crazy cold in the winter time. So it's kind of a nice mix, but yeah, I prefer the warmth as well. So do you consider a hundred a moderate temperature? Uh, no, hundred is too hot. Um, my body does not like that uh, heat stroke when I was a kid and oh no, ugh, yeah, sensitive to that stuff. So oh, no. yeah, I agree okay. though. Um, all the things you can do in the summertime and uh, with growth and plants and different things and um, just uh, just our jobs from day to day too, the amount of things that just seems like there's so much more going on in the summertime around here. So. All right, Paulson spoke. All right, so uh, Tom and then John. Hello everybody, Tom O'Donnell, City of St. Louis Park, Fleet Manager. Uh, I definitely would go with the snow. Snow and cool temps. I think snow is winning. All right, John Howard. Uh, hello, everyone. I'm uh, I'm John Howard. I work for the City of Winona as the uh, Sustainability Coordinator, uh, and I would definitely go with the heat. I don't know if I was a, a lizard in a previous life or something, but I, I definitely like it. I like it warm. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. It really is helpful to me, especially because we can't be in person. You know, that was such a magic thing to be in person um, with the first CCA meetings in 2018 and 2019. It's nice. Thank you for turning on your cameras so we can see each other, get to know each other a little bit better. Uh, great to see so many cities on, um, on, the, um, on the Zoom here. And the other thing I want to say is that um, when it comes to fleets, or when it comes to EVs and EV readiness, one of the biggest ways for a city to save money is um, with regards to the fleet. So really super excited to um, work with you guys to help you um, go on this journey and save your city some money and taxpayer money. So again, as I said at the beginning, we really wanna get you across the finish line. So we're gonna put in a poll. We wanna know, is your city planning to add an EV to your fleet in 2021? Like really want to understand who's doing that. So go ahead, their poll is up now. You can go ahead and respond to the poll. That might be, so there are five cities that are planning, six cities that are planning on adding, seven cities that are planning on adding a a vehicle. That is amazing. Awesome. Eight cities. Wow. And Chris, I'm not sure. We won't see who answered yes, right? So uh, we should. We should be able to see who answered yes. Yeah. Okay. Because otherwise, I'm going to say put in the chat if you're planning and actually just put in the chat if you know just the name of your city if you're planning to add an EV and if you know what kind um, to put in there too it just I think helps people know you know kind of what you all are thinking that would be really great eight cities that's amazing awesome anything else there are we done eight okay perfect So now I am going to put it, um, I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, Caitlin, who will just do um, an overview um, of some vehicles. Um, and then um, we'll talk a little bit about fleet analysis. Caitlin, it's all you. Thanks, Diana. Um, yeah, so we can advance to the next slide uh, since Diana already said what I'll be talking about. Um, but really just gonna go over a high level here, kind of reminding you all about the city's role in electrifying vehicles and EV adoption. Um, we'll also go over some good use cases in terms of you know, how to look at your own fleet, what makes sense there. And then I'll talk about some available vehicles in the Midwest and where the market is going. So next slide. 
All right. So uh, when we're talking about the city's role to uh, electrification, um, I'm really thinking of two main paths here. So the first one, of course, is adopting vehicles for your own fleet, which that can look in a, a lot of different ways. Um, you know, you all have different fleets. Some are big, some are small, some have medium and heavy duty vehicles, some only have light vehicles. Um, so there's a, a lot of different options here, but uh, I just wanted to call attention to a case study that we did a couple of years ago for the city of Elk River that leased a 2018 Mitsubishi Outlander. And so um, they leased it for their pool vehicle, and you can read all about the case study at the link there. All of these things that appear in yellow are links, so you can access those later. Uh, the other path here is educating residents, um, you know, community members. And so there's a couple of case studies I wanted to highlight. Uh, City of Fridley has worked with EV owners and has showcased electric vehicles at their community events. So we have a case study developed on that that you can dig into a little bit more detail. Uh, City of St. Louis Park also encourages on its website uh, for residents to purchase and lease electric vehicles. So that's another great way to show leadership and encourage people to drive electric. Uh, the last thing I wanted to point out here, um, and I'm sure we'll get into this a little bit later when Rebecca talks about resources, um, but you can access a wealth of resources on the Drive Electric Minnesota website which is another initiative that the Great Plains Institute coordinates in Minnesota. And if you're ever interested in learning more about Drive Electric Minnesota, feel free to reach out to me. Um, I help co-facilitate that organization. Um, and then you can also learn more on our website. So next slide. All right, so when you're thinking about electrifying vehicles within your own fleet. Uh, we did some analysis a couple of years ago looking at a lot of different cities that had done uh, fleet studies through Fleet Karma. And what emerged from those or from that analysis is uh, three main things to look for. So the first is looking at your average daily miles. And what we mean there is the more miles that you're driving during a day, the more savings you're going to have by switching to an electric vehicle because you get the most savings from fuel costs. So if you're not putting as much gasoline, let's say, into a vehicle and it's instead all going to be electricity, you're going to be saving a ton of money that way. Um, and there's a, a lot of good applications for this, especially if you find that you're, you're traveling less than 200 miles a day because there's a lot of electric vehicles that have ranges that would meet that. And you might not even need to charge during the day, depending on you know, what, your, what your overall travel plan looks like. Uh, the second thing we noticed is that vehicles that make a lot of short trips can also be really great use cases to electrify. Uh, so what we mean here is that, like, let's say, uh, this is just like an old utility <laughs> example, but like meter readers, for example, you know, they used to drive around uh, to every single house and there would be a lot of braking involved and electric vehicles take advantage of that rege regenerative braking because it fuels the vehicle as you're braking. Uh, so that's what we mean there. Uh, the, the third thing here is idling vehicles. So there are some positions, especially in the city and utility worlds, that uh, they drive to their site and they idle. Um, of course, it's not a best practice because you're wasting fuel, but sometimes you find that you just, you know, need to be at a location for five minutes. You leave your car running to keep the cabin warm or cool, depending on if it's a warm or hot day outside. And so if you find that you need that vehicle to be idling, if you switch over to an electric vehicle, 
uh, if you, if then your vehicle is idling, it's not polluting, which is great. Um, and then you're not losing that fuel. So you're not paying to just have your gasoline uh, emit into the atmosphere. Um, there's another thing related to idling vehicles. And this I think applies more so to utility vehicles. But uh, you know, if you're thinking about a bucket truck, for example, um, you know, they will go up to utility poles and then do some work there. They need to keep the vehicle running, uh, which can be done by electrifying the onboard equipment. And so the equipment could still be running without having your engine and tailpipe running. So that's what the auxiliary equipment is getting at. Uh, so we can go to the next slide here. Uh, I wanted to highlight all of the available all electric vehicles in the Midwest. So these are all of the vehicles that you should <laughs> theoretically be able to find in Minnesota at a dealership. Although, uh, um, you know, I would suggest before going to a dealership to do some research to figure out what dealers have these vehicles. And, you know, sites like cars.com or CarSoup or engine search engines like that can be really great tools in terms of finding these vehicles. Um, so this, all of this information was taken from Shift to Electric. Uh, Yuka Kukunen does a great job maintaining this information on the Shift to Electric website. Um, and he's going to be presenting a little bit more in detail at our next meeting in a couple of weeks. Uh, so you can get more information from him then. But uh, you can see here the range of vehicles available today. You know, there's there's a couple of SUVs on the market that are moderately priced. There's hatchbacks, sedans. Um, there's one... Yeah, no, there, there's not, not a van. There is a plug-in hybrid van, which we'll get to on the next slide. Um, but, you know, there are additional trucks and models and body styles coming out. So if you don't find something that you like today, chances are there's going to be something coming around the corner soon. And so if we go to the next slide, uh, we'll look at available plug-in hybrids, which are also plug-in vehicles, um, but these have a gasoline engine as well. Uh, so kind of getting dual benefit here, which these vehicles are good for those longer trips where you might be going up to rural Minnesota um, and you don't have a lot of charging stations along the way to rely on. And so you need something else to get you there. Uh, so plug-in hybrids can be great use cases for those types of trips. And here, of course, we see a little bit more body styles. And I just picked out the ones that have um, an, a base MSRP that's below 60000 There are a lot more luxury vehicles on the market than this. And uh, so hopefully you can find something that you like here. Again, these are all light duty applications. And so they're not covering uh, medium or heavy duty applications. All right, so next slide. Um, I just wanted to kind of talk about the examples that we're seeing in the medium and heavy duty market uh, today in Minnesota. And so what is what you'll commonly see are large walk-in vehicles that are starting to become more electrified, such as like UPS or FedEx delivery trucks. Um, we're also seeing more school buses electrified, and that's going to happen even more as funding resources from the VW or Volkswagen settlement are starting to fund those applications. Um, and then the last one here is city transit bus, which I'm sure a lot of you are aware of, um, but Minneapolis has a lot of uh, electric transit buses online today. Um, Duluth has some as well. And then Rochester has been exploring city transit buses as well. Um, so we can go to the next slide. And these are just kind of my, my last few slides here. 
But just wanted to point out where the market is going in terms of electric vehicles coming out in the next two to three years. And so you can see in front of you the list of SUVs. Uh, some of these are plug-in hybrids, but a lot of them are 100% electric. Uh, so there's just a ton of options coming out, uh, a range of luxury, but then also moderately priced uh, vehicles coming out. Personally, I'm excited about the Nissan Aria. Uh, I drive a Nissan Leaf right now and the Aria will give a little bit more cargo room. So I'm excited to see that one come out. Um, if we go to the next slide, there's uh, a list of pickup trucks coming online. Uh, again, kind of in the next couple of years. So more, more uh, standard vehicles uh, that you would think of, like the Ford F-150 are starting to become more electric. Uh, Chevrolet has announced that they're going to be electrifying pickup trucks. Uh, and then there's other makes that you can see here as well. And then the last slide, I believe, <laughs> if we advance, um, this is just some additional medium and heavy duty options. So there's one kind of mini bus coming out, which is the Volkswagen ID Buzz. If you're a fan of those old school Volkswagen buses from the past, uh, you might be excited about this model coming out. And then there are a lot of manufacturers looking at how to electrify different types of vehicles, such as delivery trucks, long ridge semi trucks, garbage trucks and snow plows, and even airplanes. So I think when we're looking at kind of the future where the market is going, there's going to be a lot more uh, vehicles that are becoming electrified over the next several years. Um, I think that's it. Yes. And so if we have time for questions, happy to take them now. Otherwise, uh, we can go on. Thanks, Caitlin. So questions. Don't see any questions. Um, hi, this is Tina. Hi, Tina. Can I go ahead? Yeah. Great. Um, I was wondering, um, of the, all of the, the vehicles that you were mentioning, um, I had taken the time to look at the state contract to see what it was that they had had available. Um, for us to, to use, and there was only a few hybrid vehicles on that. I was wondering if uh, great the, you know, your, the Great Plains Institute, if, if you thought about um, reaching out and uh, working with uh, the state of Minnesota's uh, Department of Administration procurement unit, um, so as they're moving ahead that they're more knowledgeable about what um, the options are that are available and how to better write um, the specifications so that more of those um, models are actually incorporated into um, to the state contracts? So I'll take this one. Um, they are actually really knowledgeable. Um, Marcus Grubbs um, has been working and he's um, presented to Cities Charging Ahead several times. He's actually presenting next meeting on the 28th about the state contract and the vehicles. Oh, and good. it's not always about them um, not knowing or not wanting those vehicles. You know, um, sometimes the dealerships, the OEMs just don't, um, you know, don't agree to a contract or don't um, offer it. I think they didn't have the leaf last year. I mean, and, and so part of it is, is not as outside of their con control, um, but they are trying very hard to get as many of those vehicles on there. And also in the meeting um, in two weeks on the 28th, um, we'll have Marcus talking about the state contract, but then we'll also have somebody from Sourcewell, um, which is also another cooperative purchasing opportunity. Um, and they have a wider variety of vehicles um, because they do stuff nationally. So they have a pretty big selection. And so I wanted 
folks to be able to see two different kind of cooperative purchasing. And then thirdly, we'll have um, somebody um, that SourceWell works with called National, oh, I can't remember, NCL, Government Capital, um, that uh, have devised a way to help monetize, at least partially, the tax credit to help cities um, that can't take the tax credit. So we have a great meeting next time to really dig into the purchasing. Today, we're focusing on what are the vehicles, doing fleet analysis, and then when it comes to the purchasing, we'll be really focusing on that um, two weeks from today. So yeah, they're very educated. Marcus is great. And um, I'm actually working with him, um, hopefully to get a blog about um, the state contract and what's available um, to put that out into the world as well. So we're very aware. And I, I can't look at the state contract because I'm not, you know, not a city employee. I don't have that ability. So um, I was curious, you know, what they have on board and it takes sometimes some time to get the contracts written and, and settled. So sometimes they don't have all that set and on the um, state contract for a few months after um, the vehicles come out. But thanks for the question. It's a good question. Thanks. Others? It's not like that is a big question I see in the chat here. Um, so yeah, so tune in uh, two weeks from today. Um, you can ask directly Marcus um, who does a lot of that work. All right, other questions? Okay, let's move on. So we are gonna talk about fleet analysis. Um, that is something um, that for a lot of cities is very important to do an analysis of their fleet to determine um, how many electric vehicles might fit into their fleet, what is the current performance of their fleet, on which vehicles in particular would be good for replacement. Um, and, and I think that we were, we're really hoping that at some point, not every single city has to do an entire fleet analysis to figure out which vehicles. I think, you know, Caitlin mentioned, we did this um, study and we put out a um, fleet study 101. I think um, Rebecca will talk about that a bit. Um, kind of what are the main pieces, um, you know, or elements, um, not elements, the, the right vehicle, you know, what are the, the criteria perhaps for a good replacement? And so that's actually my car. <laughs> um, and so, you know, really wanted to um, make sure folks know that, you know, uh, a number of cities have done some fleet analysis and it's really helpful to see kind of how we look at our fleets. And, um, and I think for a long time, we've really focused on what is the upfront cost and when it comes to really looking at a fleet, it's really important, especially now with um, electric vehicles to look at the total cost of ownership. And so we'll hear some of that from, we have a couple of folks that will speak um, um, on their fleet analysis. Um, but I just wanna kind of highlight the elements of a fleet study, if you wanna go to the next slide. So um, when you do a fleet study, um, you, you know, choose um, which vehicles participate in that study. Um, many vendors have a minimum of about 20 vehicles. Um, some cities have either combined with another city or with, if they have a local utility that's willing to do that, or, you know, maybe some other local government, you know, school or something. So, you know, there's ways to, to work on that. And what you do is then they install these telematic devices that monitor that data anywhere from three to 12 months. The longer you can do it, the better, the more data, the better. Um, you definitely want to catch um, at least, you know, kind of summer and some cold. Um, so I think six months is really ideal. Um, and there'll, you know, there'll be some data analysis um, that happens, you know, idling time as big as Caitlin just pointed out, kind of the patterns, uh, acceleration patterns, daily miles. Um, and then, you know, there's, um, we've got, again, there's that document that I just said, you know, the fleet lessons from cities charging ahead that we did, um, because in cities charging ahead, the first go around, um, I think 10 cities did fleet analysis through either Conexus or Excel. And um, we're going to have um, speakers today that talk about that process that they went through. And we tried to see if there was some lessons learned that we could share with cities that if they wanted to go ahead and replace a vehicle, 
um, and not necessarily go through a whole fleet study, they could do that. So um, that's a great document. Um, and so here's a link to it in the PowerPoint, but we'll make sure it's um, also just on the Google Drive. Um, and for, um, for folks that aren't aware, we'll send a follow-up and we have a Google Drive where we keep all of the notes, recordings, presentations, and other resources, documents, latest electric vehicle articles, et cetera. So that will be in a follow-up email. Um, so yeah, just high level, um, kind of the elements of a study. And now we'll turn it over to some folks that actually have done some fleet studies that can share their experience. And I think probably this is like the fifth time I've had Dave um, uh, weigh in and, and talk about the fleet karma study that he did um, with the city of Faribault. Um, which was really, um, and he's such a good speaker and has some really good um, understanding of this information. And it led to them actually purchasing some vehicles, which I think in some ways sort of surprised Dave, um, but a happy surprise. So Dave, my friend um, from Faribault, why don't you take it away? Oh, thank you, Diana. So it's uh, really great to be with all of you here today. So, and share some ideas. Chris, if you can advance the next slide or do you want me to share my screen? Okay, great. And you can advance it to the next even at this point. So we participated in um, the Fleet Karma study from June 2018 through June 2019. I do want to say that we would not have been able to do that without the help of Diana and Chris and Caitlin and you know everyone working on Cities Charging Ahead and Drive Electric Minnesota and help from all you know state agencies and so on. It's been an enormous help and we would not have been able to get to where we're at without that help. So I do encourage you to look at the Google Drive, look at the websites. It has a, a lot of information and then network with others. You know, I participated in the Southeast Minnesota cohort of Cities Charging Ahead and everyone in that group was so helpful. So that's great. Um, as uh, Diana mentioned, um, Excel Energy funded our Fleet Karma study. Um, they've partnered with us on a number of things, and we were super appreciative of their help in funding this study entirely. Um, and Fleet Karma was wonderful to work with, too, in terms of asking questions and getting data. Next slide. Um, so the study objectives really came down to a few things. One is to balance the upfront costs with the total cost of ownership savings. That was a big part of this thing, but we all were also interested in reducing greenhouse gas emissions, reducing health concerns, um, serving as a role model in helping the community transition to electric vehicles. Next. Uh, by way of background, we do not have a fleet manager and I suspect a number of you that are online today do not have a fleet manager. I think there are some challenges when you don't have a fleet manager. You really do need someone in the city that can be a champion for looking into EVs and transitioning to those EVs. I think also one of our challenges, and I'll talk about this in, in a little bit, but each department is responsible for their own vehicles. And I think, you know, there's a need to coordinate between all the departments on this, but we do not have a fleet manager. Um, part of this study, we, uh, as part of this Fleet Karma study, we analyzed 20 vehicles. And again, we looked at it in five departments from June 2018 to uh, June 2019. Also, just by way of background, we typically replace about five to 10 vehicles per year throughout the city. That includes all vehicles, including the police department, public works, vehicles, and so on. Next slide. All right, so um, Diana talked about this a little bit. Um, the highlights of our electric vehicle uh, suitability analysis study here, we use telematics. So these devices, and there's a picture of one on the left side of your screen. These are little devices that you plug into the onboard diagnostic port in a vehicle. Every vehicle has a port. Hopefully it's not getting used, but you just go ahead and plug this device in. And once you plug it in, it immediately starts transmitting regularly. Um, and the importance about this, again, I think um, Diana's point of being able to look at some of what other cities um, have done, you don't necessarily have to do this, but these telematics really give you a tremendous amount of information that I think you'll find really useful. So if you can do a fleet study where you have telematics, I think it's really worthwhile doing. Next slide. All right, so once you plug it in, you can at any time on your computer, or on your cell phone, you can look at 
um, all the vehicles, what's happening, are they driving, or are they not driving? If you have electric vehicles, it tells you the status of the charge or state of the charge and so on. So you can get all that information up front. Next slide. Um, and you can get a lot of, uh, a whole range of information. This is the total distance driven of the vehicles we have. And you can see that the police vehicles, of course, were driven the most, but things like housing inspectors and so on, not driven quite as much, but it gives you all of that information. Now, clearly you can get that information without telematics, you can figure that out, but there's value in it because you can get so much more out of it as well. So next slide. Um, some of the things you can look at is the average daily distance driven, how many times of the day it dry, you're driving those vehicles, when you're driving them, the idling, hard acceleration, hard braking, all those kinds of things. But this is collecting data at a, you know, on a regular basis, um, these telematics, putting it into a large database, and then you can do all sorts of things with it in terms of sorting information and trying to figure out how best to manage your fleet and so on. So there's some real value in the power of these databases and the information you get from these telematics. Next slide. Um, one example, um, and we've talked about this, uh, Caitlin mentioned this a little bit, but the idle percentage. I think all of us that, all the cities that participated in the studies with the fleet, um, analysis, um, notice that the idle percentage is really high on a lot of our city vehicles, really, really high. And part of that has to do with like the, the police department with all their equipment that they plug in with computers and so on, they need to have all of that. Um, but that makes them, as Caitlin mentioned, a good candidate for this. But we do have an anti-idling policy in the city and most cities do. And you can see how we are well above that for a lot of different reasons. And I notice, like on a typical winter day going into City Hall, a lot of times, um, like an inspector will come in in the morning. First thing they'll do is, you know, they'll drive into the parking lot with their car, start up a, uh, a city vehicle, go in, get coffee, do their email, do all that kind of stuff. And then 20 minutes later, go out and get in their vehicle. So we still have some issues with that, but having this factual data in front of us is really helpful to be able to have those discussions with people. Next slide. Um, you get a utilization report uh, with very detailed information on every vehicle, again, in terms of number of trips and how far you're going and so on. Next slide. Here, I'm just going to give you one example because of time. So this is the vehicle that Fleet Karma said would get the best return on investment or the total cost of operation for that vehicle. So, it, and it happened to be a school resource officer vehicle. Um, this is about six months into the study that uh, Fleet Karma did this report. At the time since, you know, that we uh, started monitoring, monitoring that vehicle, um, it had gone about 1,700 miles. Um, it idled about 64% of the time. It got an average uh, um, 10 miles per gallon. Uh, 61 of those gallons were used just idling. Um, and then it talks about the two pounds of CO2 emission per mile on that. Next slide. Um, and then I can look at, take this data and I can look at it. This is actually the, what you see in green is when that vehicle is running, when that engine is running. You can see at the very beginning, going across the top is a time frame from midnight to midnight, basically. And the green again is when that engine is on. And you can see in the beginning of the day, the car is running for about an hour while the officer is directing traffic and doing whatever the officer is doing. And then again, at four o'clock it's on, but not used a lot in between, except for maybe lunch or running here and there, I'm not quite sure. But it gives me some idea on how that vehicle is used. Next slide. And then specifically, it can tell me about every trip on there. It looks at things like ambient temp temperature, how far that car was driven, was it accelerated hard, how many times or what percent, how many times of hard braking, all that sort of information. And that's really helpful for me to be able to look at that information and see if we can be using a more efficient way of managing that vehicle. Next slide. Um, so the recommendation of Fleet Karma on this, they have a proprietary 
algorithm that looks at all this information, you give them the information on what your electric costs are, fuel costs, those kinds of things. And then they analyze the full fleet and they give you a report back. In this case, they said that 2013 Ford Taurus that we're using now for that school resource officer, if we replaced it with a Nissan Leaf, a, a battery operated vehicle, we'd be saving a total cost of ownership savings around $11,500, right? So that was our top vehicle that they identify. Now you have to take that information at the city and make some assumptions. In our case, there's no range issues. Rarely was that a vehicle used over 10 miles a day. They were recommending a level two charger. I, you know, based on how we actually would be using it, we could probably not even need a level two charger on that. But you also have to look at and say, how is the police vehicle being used? Um, you know, if they've got all this equipment plugged in, is, um, is how is the battery gonna hold up for that? Um, is the Nissan LEAF appropriate for this use and so on? And that isn't coming out directly in the study. So you have to make some decisions on and how you're gonna use that data. Next slide. So overall, what our study found through Fleet Karma is out of the 20 vehicles that we tested, six of them actually were found to have a total cost operation savings. So 14 of them did not make the cut for a variety of reasons. As I mentioned, the school resource officer, that was top at 11,500. We had about a total of $32,000 of savings, but some of our vehicles, so last on that list, you, it's hard to probably see it on your screen, but a, a 2007 Chevrolet Impala, um, if we replace that with the Nissan Leaf, it was only coming in at $623 savings. The reason that is, and there's different reasons for some of these things in the algorithm, but that vehicle doesn't get used that much. So if that's the case, it's gonna take a long time to get those savings back out of it. So you have to look at this information and realize that not always though, is the main reason that you wanna replace an internal combustion engine have to do with total cost of operation savings. There might be some other reasons for doing that as well. Next slide. So just to conclude on some things, I think when you do a fleet study, you really need to be able to say, okay, how are we gonna use this information and not just take the study and let it sit there. You gotta be able to implement it. And what I did was reviewed the study results with all the departments and the council, had a good discussion about what's working, what, how we can improve it and so on. I encouraged all departments to reevaluate their actual needs. So like in my department, community and economic development, we have five vehicles. I looked at the fleet analysis data and went, we don't need five vehicles. I mean, we've got a number of vehicles that are, are just sitting there and they may not be used for a week. And then when they are used, they're just you know a little bit here and there. So we actually eliminated one of the vehicles. I think we could maybe even go down to three vehicles if we wanted to. But that data from the telematics was really clear to me that we could do that. So we eliminated one of those vehicles and I'm encouraging all the other departments to do the same. The thing I mentioned earlier about fleet managers, I think it's really difficult um, if you don't have that, you have to be a champion in the city and you have to be able to coordinate between all the departments because I think you can use your fleet much more efficiently if you're all working together. Also encourage uh, people to use the most of, uh, use the most efficient vehicle the most. Um, we have an issue with that because people do like to use their same vehicle. So a building official wants a four wheel drive pickup even if they're going to look at someone's deck in the backyard, they don't need a four wheel drive pickup to go to that. They can easily take the Nissan Leaf and we're trying to get people to make sure that those vehicles are used most. We're also working on reducing idling. It's been challenging and then encouraging eco driving. One thing that's really interesting and I'm almost done here, but eco driving, People love driving our Nissan Leaf. They like our Outlander, but they really love the Leaf. And it's interesting. I think they get in the, the electric vehicle and it has so much torque and pickup and it's fun to drive. They drive it really sporty-like. I, I guess that's saying it in a nice way of taking off really fast and doing all those kinds of things. But so I, it's ironic that I, I think the... Uh, um, people are not necessarily following eco driving with, with their electric vehicle like they should. Next slide. And this I believe will be my last slide. Um, one thing I would also encourage, um, once the study was done, I presented this, but I think what really, really helped was the ride and drive event. So Caitlin and others helped us with the ride and drive event. We opened it up to the full community as well as the surrounding communities. 
Um, and I think it was so important for people to be able to drive things like the Mitsubishi Outlander. And, and it just helped enormously to get them um, to give us some feedback. And it was, I thought, really well received. We're working on charging stations. We're continuing to do that. You can see the picture on the bottom of the screen. Um, we're actually plugging in that Nissan Leaf to a 110, 115. I don't have a level two charger, but the reality is we're getting by. I mean, you can charge the whole thing over the weekend, all night long and so on. And we're doing the same thing with the Mitsubishi Outlander. So we're gonna continue to transition to electric vehicles. If I had my choice, I would still begin to think about budgeting for even another um, study with the fleet analysis, because I think as we get more electric vehicles, being able to monitor the, the loads and do it in a smart way, the fleet analysis with the telematics can really help with that a lot. So I believe that's all I have. If um, the last slide up there is just my contact information. So if you are interested in um, talking ever, just feel free to send me an email or send me or call and I'm happy to get into more detail, just like others have helped us. I'm, I'm really help, happy to share whatever I can from Faribo. And I'll turn it back to uh, Diana. Dave, thanks so much. And, uh, you know, I think it's so interesting that you're saying that so many people love the LEAF because one of the things we talked a lot about in Cities Charging Ahead 1.0, <laughs> named um, um, uh, retrospectively, um, was the truck guy truck culture and that we, you know, there was a real concern that, you know, these little electric vehicles weren't something that, especially in greater Minnesota, people would drive. So it's really encouraging to hear. Um, and I think that that's one of the things, they are fun to drive. But of course, if you drive it on sport mode and not in eco all the time, it kind of diminishes a bit <laughs> the, the cost savings, but not crazy. Um, so that was really great. Um, I think we'll just go to Matt and then we'll have question and answer after unless um, somebody has a quick question. I think I'll just I think I'll just wait and we'll just go to Matt and then we'll have question and answer with both of them um, at the same time. So very lucky, you know, most of the cities that we've worked with here in Minnesota have used Fleet Karma. Um, and we had heard and we knew that there was this other um, company, Saywatch, and I think they're sort of now connected through Geotab, it's, it's a confusion for me. So, um, but we found out um, that in Olmstead County, they used Saywatch Labs to do some fleet analysis for the county. And so I wanted to show these two different um, kind of case studies about fleet analysis and, um, and then have a conversation. So um, thank you, Matt, for being willing um, to join us and share your experience in Olmstead County um, and um, take it away. Yeah, you're welcome. Good morning, everyone. Uh, thanks for the opportunity to talk a little bit about the study that we did in Olmstead County. Um, so as I said in the intro, Matt Miller, I'm Director of Facilities and Building Operations in Olmstead County. So to Dave's point, there aren't necessarily fleet managers in cities. Um, same thing as on the county side. So facilities and building operations, I brought up some concerns in the uh, motor pool and in the fleet. So guess what? It uh, has fallen under me, I guess, to, to be able to, to manage and keep an eye on. So you can go to the next slide. So I'll just answer some basic questions. And then if there are questions at the end, happy to take those. So the reason that we did the motor pool study was uh, kind of a two-pronged approach. Uh, number one is Olmstead County is actually a member of an energy integration committee within the city of Rochester. So if people are familiar with Destination Medical Center, City of Rochester, they've been doing a lot of work when it comes to sustainability. And what this group has done is created some climate action goals that looks at the amount of renewable energy. Um, and this is obviously done with partners. We have a very large medical institution in town. We have Rochester Public Utilities, gas utility, uh, trying to look at opportunities to reduce greenhouse gas emissions and meet some of these climate action goals across the entire community. When I started, uh, I've been with the county about four years now. Every time I came into the office, there was always motor pool vehicles just sitting there. Uh, and to Dave's point, you know, they might be short trips. Uh, people might start them early in the morning. Just anecdotally, it felt like we needed to study our motor pool because it did not look like a good use of resources. Um, so as I said, I'll talk about this in a little bit. We, we took a two-pronged approach, both looking at electrification as well as the size of our fleet. And then number three, in Olmstead County, uh, we actually have a waste to energy facility. And what we export out of that facility is steam and electricity. 
Um, now, obviously, there's different approaches to managing solid waste, burn or bury. Um, there's some, you know, arguments to be made on is it renewable energy, where is the carbon captured, where are the greenhouse gas emissions, but the reality is uh, we've had a waste energy facility in Olmsted County for several years. That's been the approach to managing solid waste. And with those exports, it kind of gives us a unique opportunity to capture those utility sources uh, to be able to do creative things with it and obviously um, kind of um, message that across the community. So next slide. So as Diana said, you know, recommendation is to look at that three to 12 months. Uh, we did our study over a four month period. So August through November in 2019. Uh, one of the reasons that we did it over a four month period was we were trying to hit our budget cycle. Um, so we decided kind of late in the year to do our fleet study and we were hoping to hit the 2020 budget cycle. So normally the county board sets their uh, levy at the last meeting in December. Uh, so that's really the reason that we shortened our study. Uh, would we have got different information over a longer period? Probably. Uh, but as Diana said, we tried to capture some of the, the uh, different seasons. So we captured at the end of summer. Uh, we captured winter, uh, as she put it. And then obviously early winter uh, going into November. So GeoTab was the device or was the company we use for telematics. So Dave talked about that. We ended up studying 50 vehicles. The large majority of those vehicles were motor pool available to be checked out by staff. There were three or four fleet vehicles, I'll call them in there, which were dedicated vehicles to a particular department. Uh, as Dave said, they just plug into your OBD2 uh, port, so it's plug and play. We actually had our, our um, fleet uh, me mechanics install all the GeoTab devices, so they're very easy to install. They completed them all in one day because what you have to do is try and figure out when you plug those in, do you activate them that day uh, because they start to collect data right away. So we wanted to, to try and tighten that to have as clean a data as possible. And some of the other things, uh, kind of unintended consequences or unintended benefits of the telematics devices. Number one, I show a speed profile here. So yes, this was a county vehicle going 91 miles per hour in a 70 mile per hour zone. Um, and while we weren't necessarily using it for that, there's so many things that telematics tell you. Um, a, a quick story, we actually did have someone in St. Paul call in a complaint to Olmstead County saying we were just passed by an Olmstead County vehicle. They were swerving in and out, they were speeding. Um, and we approached the employee uh, and asked them if, if they recall that they're like, nope. So we actually brought up the telematics and you could see them crossing the Highway 52 bridge in St. Paul by the second, what speed they were going, where they were located. Um, and it was useful information in that particular instance, but not necessarily um, related to either electrification or the size of the motor pool. Next slide. So how much? Dave didn't necessarily talk about this. Uh, our study cost uh, just about $30,000. Um, and as I say here, it does not include internal staff costs. So we had our motor pool mechanics install the OBD2 or the GeoTab devices. We had to do some record keeping internally to, to manage which GeoTab device was installed in which vehicle. Um, how do we keep track of records? So that was just the cost directly with Saywatch Labs. Um, for the study. And as I said, we studied both electrification uh, and right size, so we'll get into that. Uh, and similar to Dave, um, with those 50 vehicles, we replace about one-tenth of our vehicles every year. We're on a 10-year replacement cycle or 100,000 miles. So looking at our 2020 list here, these are the vehicles that we purchased in 2020. Our simple ROI or payback was two months. Um, on the cost of the study. If you figure that, you know, the cost of a new Voyager Equinox is roughly $30,000, this study really paid for itself uh, in a very short time, um, just because it indicated, and we'll get to this, that we had too many vehicles in our fleet. Uh, and we did not receive any additional funding. So this was fully funded out of the motor pool fund, um, where we do internal service charges based on mileage for departments to use motor pool vehicles. Next slide. So what did we learn? As I said, we evaluated 50 vehicles. We looked at electrification and right sizing. So a couple different images here. The image on the right is really the total summary of our electrification opportunities. So across all 50 vehicles, 
it showed that our total cost of ownership actually was cost parity, no significant savings. But that's across 12 different EV candidates. So similar to what Dave said, we had some candidates that were very attractive and others that were marginal. Uh, the other thing that I wanna point out is when you go into the fleet study, you need to decide the data on the front end because junk in is junk out. They're gonna ask questions about what assumptions do you wanna make for the cost of fuel? What are the assumptions you wanna make on maintenance costs? So as I said, in Olmstead County, we do all of our maintenance internal. Um, so we are able to, to manage our costs a little bit more or have a, a better understanding. If you happen to outsource with a dealership, um, you may or may not be able to, to have that information. So really understanding those metrics or the data that you're gonna to use to inform this financial analysis is very important. Operational costs went down, fuel usage went down, greenhouse gas emissions went down. So we do have several candidates that uh, could be electrified. The one on the left is more about right sizing. So duty cycles was mentioned a little bit in the intro about what duty cycles are. So the easiest way that I can uh, describe or explain a duty cycle is if I'm going to take out a sedan uh, from 9 a.m. to 10 a.m. and Diana is going to take a sedan from 9.30 to 10.30, that's two duty cycles. So you're not able to have that one vehicle serve both people from 9.30 to 10 o'clock. Um, if I take it from nine to 10 and she takes it to from 10 to 11, that's one duty cycle because there's no overlap there. So what I'm showing here is, uh, this is an excerpt from the final study or, or executive summary showing that, especially if I look at the bottom row there, uh, we have 22 vehicles across our combined locations uh, out at our, our campus where we have a bunch of separate buildings. So all those zeros across the bottom mean that we're able to meet all the duty cycles by removing five vehicles from our fleet. If we remove that sixth vehicle from our fleet, we only have one duty cycle across a four month period that's not met. The other thing that we learned is we were reimbursing about 500,000 miles on an annual basis across county departments. So people are not very good at using our motor pool. Uh, so reducing these, these duty cycles, we have to evaluate whether we require use of motor pool for, for out of county or you know away from office trips or not. So these are kind of the two components. Um, and like I said, I'm happy to take questions on the end or I've included my contact information if people wanna understand this a little bit more. Uh, so next slide. So now what, you know, what are the next steps? Uh, we did the study, we completed it a, a little over a year ago. Um, we identified that we could reduce the size of our motor pool fleet. We had candidates for electrification. Uh, so where are we today? Um, so, you know, this was all done pre-COVID um, and we've obviously learned a lot internally through COVID. And since July, we have 10 vehicles that have not physically moved in that time period. So obviously with remote work, we're trying to do as much remote work and telework as possible as an organization. We have a lot of vehicles that are not getting used. So we are going to continue evaluating this moving forward. We have a policy analysis and communications department, and we're gonna partner with them to continue to evaluate, number one, what does our remote work uh, kind of look like moving forward as far as teleworking? We've had about two thirds of our staff teleworking through COVID and about one third in the office. So that obviously impacts our motor pool pretty significantly. So as a result, we're not gonna purchase any vehicles in 2021. So I answer no to the poll question, uh, not that we don't intend to purchase EVs or, or, or plug-in hybrids, uh, we just don't plan to purchase any vehicles, frankly, because we have too many. Um, so that really helped our ROI, as I said, to be about two months, just because we're not replacing vehicles. Uh, we do have plans uh, to purchase EVs or PHEVs uh, as we move forward. And what we're doing is we're considering electrical infrastructure when we do construction projects. So we've recently constructed a couple buildings and parking lots where we're putting in the conduits or the infrastructure for level two charging. So we have a pretty long dwell time. Uh, you know, as Dave said, in their instance, that vehicle sits over the weekend, sits overnight. We have similar dwell times. So a level one charger maybe would meet our needs. We don't think we're at the point where we need DC fast chargers unless we start to look at some of our, our squad cars or, or sheriff's department vehicles. So we're really making plans to put conduit and stuff in place for those level two chargers. As I said, we're gonna continue an, eva an evaluation moving forward. And the remote work project really has a lot to do with that. So this evaluation is gonna continue into 2021. I don't see us 
reinstalling telematics or those geotab devices. I think we're going to just going to take the data that we learned. And then, as Dave said, we have, you know, other reports through a, a fleet management software or mileage reports where we can kind of anecdotally try to get to some of that data. Um, so this uh, image that's shown here is an example of one of our top candidates. Uh, so this was a, a Chevy Colorado pickup. Uh, it's actually saying that it could be replaced by a sedan. So as Dave said, or as Diana said, you know, that, that preference to drive large vehicles, four-wheel drive vehicles, trucks. Um, the reality was it could be replaced by a sedan and still meet all the needs. Uh, so overall rating of 100 there, it was tracked uh, for 127 days, 256 trips. So I know it's kind of small here on the screen, but in this particular instance, our total cost of ownership, we would save three to $6,000 on this one vehicle alone, if we went to their suggestion was a 2019 Volkswagen e-Golf uh, battery electric vehicle. Um, so next slide. So as I said, happy to take questions, um, happy to, to try and help people out. My contact information is here, so feel free to reach out. I'm, I'm happy to share more information from our study. We learned a lot, it was really beneficial and um, looking forward to continuing the analysis moving forward. Awesome. Thank you so much, Matt. And you brought up something um, that I think is interesting and that has been one of the challenges for the Fleet Karma studies. Um, some people didn't really want Big Brother in their vehicle. <laughs> um, and I know that, that was, that's that been an issue in some of the cities where the studies were done. And, you know, it wasn't intended to be like to monitor, you know, if people were um, going over the speed limit or any of those things. Um, but that information did come out. Um, and I think, you know, I, I know in some fleet studies, you know, there were people that took them out, wouldn't drive the vehicles that had them in, et cetera. Um, and of course, what you just described as the, the um, complaint wasn't from the telematics, it was from somebody calling you, but then you were able to verify it. So that is one of the challenges, um, you know, that people don't really want to be monitored, but let's just say if you're going 91 miles an hour in a county vehicle, it's probably not a good idea. Like, just not. <laughs> um, and um, so, and, and I really also appreciate kind of the context of our current state of affairs that with more people working from home, there's a less need of a, a, the pool. And so not only are you not adding vehicles, you're subtracting four vehicles. It makes sense. I mean, and that's actually part of a fleet study is, can you reduce the size of the fleet? Because that also saves you money. Like, so um, right sizing the fleet, that's actually a Green Step City best practice. Um, so right sizing the fleet and then getting the right vehicles. Um, and, you know, regardless of that, um, the point being that as you go forward and purchase new vehicles that you're really looking at, you know, looking at hopefully electric vehicles first and then eliminating that if that doesn't feel like it's right. But first having the framework let's consider an EV first. And if not, then we can do something else, but having the frame going forward when you purchase a vehicle. So I appreciate the context because I do think, you know, in addition to, you know, um, reviewing office space, our organization is reviewing office space now. Um, you know, vehicles are the same kind of thing. We live in a totally new world. So um, appreciate it. Okay, let's, um, let's put the Let's take this, let's stop sharing perhaps the screen and just have faces and do Q&A. You've got to have some questions for these guys. Um, you know, great work on, you know, fleet studies, um, questions if you haven't done fleet studies. And I think we were going to do, um, were we going to do a poll about um, if folks had done or were planning on doing a fleet study, Chris? Yeah, we can do that now or during the discussion is when we had flagged it. Oh, we'll do it during the discussion then. Let's just do it now. Question and answer. Go ahead and just unmute and pop in and ask questions, especially if you're a city that's thinking about or potentially interested in a fleet study. You know, what are the questions that you might have for these guys? Or is there anything else, Dave or Matt, that you want to share that 
I'm happy to make one quick comment on what you said about communications and some of that anxiety that staff expressed. So we realized that pretty early on and communications was a significant component of this fleet study. So I know I, I kind of rushed through this presentation. I didn't mention that, but we worked closely with our communications team and sent it out countywide to let people know why we were doing the study because the same thing. The reality is our, our number one and two violations that we found where people don't wear their seatbelts and they speed. Um, and we didn't necessarily advertise that back to staff because we told staff we're looking at size of the fleet and electrification. On the flip side, when we look to make the transition to EVs or PHEVs, education and communication is going to be a big deal. A lot of people say, well, how do I start an electric vehicle? How do I drive it? Does it have an accelerator? Does it have a gas pedal? You know, does it have a hand throttle? They just, that it's, it's that, that ignorance about not knowing the differences. So that's going to be something that we have to address looking at that transition as well. Yeah. And I think that, that a ride and drive for staff is really critical. And Dave, when you said you did the ride and drive, was that just for city staff or was that a public one? Cause that is public. one way, go, go ahead. It was public, um, but it was really helpful to have the police and some of the public work and, and inspectors drive some of those vehicles. One other thing that was interesting on this is we had two Teslas as part of our ride and drive and people say, well, Teslas, are you, are you actually gonna buy Teslas for the city? But I will tell you that a number of city staff came specifically because they wanted to drive the Tesla. And once they were there to drive the Tesla, then they looked at the Leaf and the Bolt and the Outlander and other vehicles, so. Anyway, you, the, I thought it was very successful. And again, Caitlin helped us through that and others. So it was really Beat and switch. Yeah. I've, got, I've got one question. Sure, Lynn. Um, how would the vehicles perform in the wintertime, you know, and, and in the extreme heat in the summertime? Did you see a, a reduced um, be, um, usage or mileage um, that you got out of them? Well, I can answer it from uh, mine and then Matt can. Yeah, it, there, are, there is absolutely some difference. And I will say, I, I made the decision to not get a winter package on our Nissan Leaf. And I don't know if Diana and Caitlin and others have winter package on it, but I have gotten some complaints about that, that on a very cold day, that they just can't stay warm in the car. And so I've gotten some complaints about that. And then when we have used it to go in the winter, like from um, Faribault to Rochester, I think there has been some of that uh, range anxiety um, because of, uh, you know, you just don't have the same amount of um, available uh, power. So it is something that is an issue. One other thing that I will point out on the plug-in hybrids, I know a lot of people really love the uh, Outlander and a lot of cities have it. One thing I noticed is, and I asked our building official who drives our Outlander the most, I said, do you really just be honest with me? How much are you using the electric versus the gas? He said, no, I try to use it as much as I can. He said, well, I don't see you plugging it in that often. I mean, I, every now and then. He says, oh, I just use the gas. You know, I just push the button to have the gas engine regenerate it. And that clearly is not the intent here um, in using that electric. So, you know, we've had that discussion on that. But um, I think overall, again, people have uh, loved it. Um, but he does, you know, in the winter, he will idle the thing for 20 minutes before getting into it, and it defeats some of the purpose. You know, I, I'll say that I don't know what the winter package is. I don't even remember looking at that. Um, I haven't had an issue being cold. I mean, it just, it draws on the battery, and there's a little bit less battery when it's colder, you know, and as the temperature goes down, it, it weighs on the battery, but if you have a pretty long range vehicle and you drive average 10 miles, 20 miles, 30 miles, 40 miles, it's not going to make a difference and it should, you should be able to be warm. It's just if you're, if you're going a long distance and you're trying to preserve the battery that you might, you know, there's heated steering, heated seats, et cetera, that you can, you know, kind of make that battery go longer. But um, it, mine warms up pretty quickly. My, my issue is more of the tires. Um, not like other, you know, small sedans, you know, you probably want snow tires in Minnesota. So um, that's more of an issue. Um, there was a, a question in there about the, um, about the, uh, about ride and drive and who provided the vehicles. We do have an, an excellent ride and drive dual toolkit on the Drive Electric Minnesota site. And it's actually a, a PDF folder. And so we can add that to the Google Drive. So that's easy to, for folks to find as well. Um, so let's see, um, Caitlin highly recommends the winter package for the leaf. 
Oh, so I do have that. I have heated steering and heated seats. Um, that makes a huge difference. Oh, she put in the link for the ride and drives there. So other questions? John Paulson. I have a question uh, uh, primarily for David, but I'm sure Matt, you probably uh, could answer some of it as well. Um, of the vehicles that you assess, so as an example, uh, it looked like you assessed a few police vehicles, but um, do you draw some assumptions on the other police vehicles? Like if I, I'm guessing you don't have just one Ford Fusion police vehicle. There's probably right. more than that. Um, did you take it a step further and do analysis on the remaining Ford Fusions that had the best return? Or uh, is there a plan in place to just start transitioning all of them towards one direction? Well, I hope there isn't a plan. And one of the challenges, again, is we don't have that fleet manager. And so I'm relying on having the discussion with the police chief about this. But um, there are really great packages out there for the, all the police vehicles, you know, with the Ford Interceptor and other things. Um, and I think just having some of those test drives and there are other organizations, I think the police chief mentioned that others are trying to promote it and so on. So he's learning about that. Uh, but we, I, I think we can easily transition to some of that. Clearly, I think in some cases it's going to be a plug-in hybrid, um, but um, yeah, I mean, we're having those discussions right now. So I am planning in it. Yeah, and from our standpoint, uh, we studied 50 vehicles. That was the motor pool. As I said, it's not all of our fleet vehicles. So we are, um, you know, drawing some of those conclusions about how it would impact other vehicles. We did not study our sheriff's office uh, deputy vehicles. So we didn't go into that. So it would take a little bit more work. Um, and as I said, working with policy analysis and communications, that's where we're hoping to try and tie out some of that data because we only studied 50 of the vehicles and didn't actually physically put telematics in all of them. I think it's a pretty incredible thing to really locate that data and then um, to really try to understand, wrap your head around how different um, different entities are and different departments are. Um, mm -hmm. uh, Olmstead County with their sheriff's fleet um, they are, they're going to travel a lot further than, say, the city of Rochester, um, just because of the service area that they cover. Um, and likewise, too, I, I love the idea with the uh, analysis with the monitors that were put in those vehicles, too, that there's tons of other benefits, too, just from understanding driving habits and um, the compliance things with uh, uh, driving legally as well, speeding, seat belts, all those things. But um, really the idling time and really understanding you know, when these vehicles are being driven and what kind of those habits are, or what their use is. Um, to use that to reduce your fleet by four or five vehicles. I mean, like they always, the most efficient light bulb is one that's not on. The most efficient right. vehicle is one that's not, you don't need. So um, I think that's great information. Thank you guys. And John, didn't, was it you or was it the Muni that was getting or got a Outlander? Um, I know the Muni's been talking about it. I don't know if they actually did or not, but um, okay. they were looking at getting something like that to kind of pilot internally. Yeah, I know that Dave was talking about that. Um, so Tina's question, when looking at the charging infrastructure, did either of you consider allowing the public to also use the chargers? Looking at having a dual use on the charger for fleet and public use. I know a number of cities have done that, have dual use, but um, just kind of the question to you all. Um, for the city of uh, Faribault, you no, know, we are, we're lucky. We, we um, are part of the BW um, grant. And so we are getting a DC fast charger and two level two chargers um, right in our downtown, right by our city hall. So that's um, wonderful. But I know this group has had many discussions about this in different cities that allow like the first 30 minutes to, you know, the public to pl plug in and those kinds of things. We haven't gotten that far yet, but I think we got to have that discussion. So that, that was next on my list is really getting this infrastructure figured out. And, and it seems like it depends on, you know, when your vehicles for your fleet are charging and when is it available for the public? How often is the public at City Hall or in a public works parking lot where your fleet charging. I mean, I think there's a whole bunch of factors depending on your city, the number of buildings, where you put the charger, but that's a good, um, something to have in your mind as you think about and you're thinking about putting in these chargers. You know, do you wanna put it somewhere where there can be a dual use? If you're gonna put it in, might as well have it used. Can there be a dual use? So it's a really good um, point to bring up, Tina, as people are planning and thinking about um, 
where their charging infrastructure for their fleet goes and if there's an opportunity for the public to also use that. Well, and Diana, I might mention too that just in our city charging ahead, when we've gone to like Rochester Public Utilities, and I know uh, Drew Larson's on the line, but they've got the, the chargers there. And a number of people that are coming to those meetings are plugging in while at that meeting. And we've had the same thing with our staff using the Nissan Leaf. When we've gone to Rochester, we've talked about, we've called ahead and said, is there an available charger that we can use just to make sure we don't have that range in anxiety on the way back, for example. So yeah, I think it is something that you should be looking at for sure. Awesome. Diana, do you, yeah. can you see many uh, cities that are doing that successfully so we could have a side conversation with them about it? Um, so cities on the call here, could you put in the chat? I, I, Woodbury, maybe. Jen, you'd have to put in St. Louis Park, maybe. Um, Shoreview, right? But I don't know that. Well, Shoreview, wrong, but... I sure you put in a charger, but I don't think they have an EV yet, or maybe they do. I don't know. Um, so oh, yeah, Jen from Winbury. I'm sorry. What was the question? We have people doing some work, and I got distracted. <laughs> Go ahead, Tina. I was curious if you have uh, charging units that you are using for fleet purposes, but then also allowing the public to access them um, for charging. And if you do, um, how are you handling that? So we just installed our first level two charger at our um, fleet services building and it's not accessible to the public. Um, we're looking to install five dual chargers at City Hall in 2022. Um, and those again will just be dedicated to fleet. I think with, um, like we've brought it up to our city council before as far as, um, you know, whether we wanna have public chargers and there's just a lot of questions on whether that's, you know, our role or whatnot. So we've just decided we're gonna focus on fleet first and then we'll, um, you know, move forward from there. But um, so, so far we don't have any city owned public chargers. You know, and I might add that one of the other things coming up is the staff, um, you know, being able to, especially for staff that commute and they may have a vehicle that doesn't have that long range um, that may want to charge. So those are things to think about. Yeah, good point. Um, Edina might have one up, uh, you know, uh, I can connect you, Tina, with Edina. They might have dual use with theirs. It's hard for me to remember all of them. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so they're sure view. They have they have two dual chargers at City Hall, but they don't have any EVs in their fleet, so it's not an issue. But they do have some staff that drive EVs that I, I believe can certainly plug in because they're public chargers. Uh, or maybe they I, maybe um, Marie, you can weigh in about whether staff are allowed to use those public chargers at this point. Um, but I, Edina might be in that situation. I don't think there's a lot of that. I think often it's sort of separate because the fleet charging um, infrastructure is usually at a public works or a place where normally the public isn't. Um, so it might not be super useful, but good question. Um, and unless there are, I think we're gonna move on because I wanna make sure my colleague Rebecca has enough time to talk about the resources. So we've, you know, thank you, Matt, and thank you, Dave. Um, we're gonna talk about what are the resources um, that we have, and we've mentioned some throughout here, but I'm gonna turn it over to Rebecca, our Green Corps member who has been focused on electric vehicles. So happy to have her um, join us. Thanks, Rebecca. Oh, thank you, sorry, just had to unmute there for a second. Um, as mentioned, my name is Rebecca and I am here to talk to you about the different resources that are available. So the first resource that I would like to highlight is the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency. Uh, it sounds like a lot of you are really interested in the, or uh, are, are looking for different ways to fund your fleet vehicles. And the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency has a lot of different contracts, grants, and loan opportunities for you. And I'm not going to get too much into them today just because they are pretty variable in what they cover and when they drop. And so the only one that I will focus on is the Volkswagen settlement or the VW settlement. And it sounds like a lot of you are already utilizing this resource, but for those of you who are unaware, 
it is a cost sharing grant and it has three phases and we are currently in phase two. Phase two started last year in 2020 and it goes on until 2023. And in this phase, the MPCA will distribute $23.7 million um, to different efforts for electrification. There have already been in this phase RFPs that have closed, but right now there is a grant that's open for EV level two charging stations. It is due February 8th. So if this is something that you haven't looked at yet, but are interested in, I would say sooner rather than later, um, because it is less than a month away at this point. There are two other RFPs that are expected to drop this spring, so the spring of 2020. And one is on non-electric school bus replacements. So the possible replacement fuel types for this include diesel, propane, and gas. And the second one is this uh, heavy duty on-road vehicles and electric equipment RFP. I included, as you can see, a link to the MPCA's page on the Volkswagen settlement where you can find all the information on this. As I said, each one is very distinct, unique. Um, and so I would recommend looking at that for your information. Also, I want to highlight uh, Meshabeen Rahman. She's the mobile source specialist for the MPCA and also I believe the state program administrator for the Volkswagen settlement. And she would be more than happy to answer any questions that you might have about the VW settlement and also point you in the right direction to other funding opportunities available through the MPCA. I included her email and her phone number. And so I think it would be really useful for you to reach out to her and she'd be more than happy to help. All right, so the next resources that I would like to to point out are the our different buying guides. And there's three that I'm going to show you today. Oops, you know what, I apologize. My cat has not been on this thing the entire time. And of course, once I start talking, she's interested in me. So um, there are three buying guides, the Shift to Electric, XL Energy, and Plug Star. And to talk about these, I'm actually going to show them to you just because it's a little easier to see them um, than just talking about them. So I hope everyone can see um, the shift to electric page. This, I believe both Diana and um, Caitlin mentioned this previously, but this shift to electric is updated by Yuka Kukinen and he has three different resources on this page um, that are different EV info lists. The one that I think are, is most helpful to us is this Midwest EV info list because it's uh, electric vehicles that you can find specifically in the Midwest, but there's also one about models available in the entirety of the US. So if I were to click on this, it would bring you to this page here and it is just a spreadsheet that details the different makes and models that are available in the Midwest, the cost, the range, charging speed, and different performance metrics, including things like towing capacity. So this is a really nice resource just to get a general overview of what's available and what's out there. Um, and Yuka Kukin, he keeps this updated fairly recently, or, fairly often. And I believe the last time that was updated was December of 2020. So uh, it's only a month old. The second resource I would like to highlight is the Excel Energies EV page. They have three different resources on this page. The first one here is the EV charging programs. This is just an interactive map of different places where you can find charging stations throughout the US. I really like this discover the incentives and rebates. It brings you to different incentives that are available specifically in Minnesota. And also some of them are specific to XL Energy customers. They also have a nice shopping assistant here. So you just would click on the find your electric vehicles. And this one compared to the EV info list is 
a bit more interactive because you can choose um, different variables such as what your trip, your, the commutes would be for your car, your budget, and then the type of car that you would like. So once you have those filters in, it will show you specific cars and you can click on a car and it will bring you more and give you more in-depth details, including things such as the monthly cost to fill up in, com in comparison to um, a equivalent gas cars, and then also the cost of ownership and the cost to break even. So I really like this resource because it is interactive as compared to the EV info list. The third and final buying guide that I uh, have for you today is the Plug Star shopping list. And this one is also interactive and it asks you to put in your, your zip code so it is specific to your area and will show you incentives that are specific to Minnesota, which is nice. So you'll go through, it brings you through in the interest of time, I'm not going to do it, but it brings you through a bunch of different um, questions that you can, once again, refine your search. And once you get through it, it will bring you to a list of cars that match your, um, your wants, I guess. And you can click on the car to get more specific information about the cars. One thing that I like about this shopping guide is that it allows you to click on these hearts and then it will actually compare the cars for you, which is really nice. I appreciate that. Um, so yeah, so that is our buying guide. And I've included links to all of them and this PowerPoint will be going out in the um, follow-up resources. So you'll have links to all those. Two other resources to highlight are, I kind of like to think of the, the Fleets for the Future and the Drive Electric Minnesota as uh, resources within resources because they provide a lot of links to other resources that you can find. So it's very valuable. I will pull it, this up again just so you can see it. Um, the Fleets for the Future has, as I mentioned, all these different links and different cost calculators. They also have, which I find the most helpful on their page, are these um, best practices. Um, and these are really in-depth guides. For you, I think the most helpful ones as you're looking to electrify your fleet would be the guide to the guides, also this electric vehicle procurement best practice guide, as well as the fleet vision planning for alternative fuel vehicles. And finally, on the Drive Electric Minnesota page, this also, they have wonderful resources on here um, for EV benefits and saving and how charging works. I'll also show you because I saw that there was some interest in the ride and drives, if you go to the electric vehicles, there's this ride and drive tab that is the toolkit for um, if you're interested in putting on a ride and drive. There's also a cities charging ahead resource here. So um, I guess it's the 1.0. I would also like to point out the last thing for the drive electric is this one pager that Caitlin previously mentioned that was the fleet study 101 it was it is just detailing the lessons learned from the different cities that did do the fleet karma analysis all right also caitlin and i were working on developing a fleet toolkit for the drive electric minnesota website and just as a heads up i might be reaching out to some of you to get your insights on what is helpful for you to see in this toolkit. The final, uh, the final resource that I would like to highlight is myself. Part of my job description is helping you connect to resources that you need. So if you can't remember a resource that we talked about on this webinar, or maybe there's a topic that 
wasn't covered or you would like more in depth, please feel free to email me and I am happy to help and connect you with those resources. So I believe that's about my time. I'm gonna stop on sharing my screen, but I really do encourage you all to, um, to review these resources and become familiar with them because they are very helpful. Thank you, Rebecca, that was awesome. <clears throat> um, questions? There are a lot of resources. So, you know, if, if, you, if you're not sure how to, where to start or what to do, um, there are a lot of resources and maybe even sometimes it feels like too many, not sure where to go or what to do. And I know not all of you are Excel Energy um, customers. Doesn't mean you can't use their website to look at vehicles and compare them. So, you know, um, we've got a couple of great resources with the, you know, um, Yuka's Shift to Electric Buyers um, information and as well as the, the Excel site. So any questions about resources? I have a quick question and sure. Rebecca, you may not know this answer, but you had mentioned earlier on when you were talking about the MPCA, how we're in phase two of this particular grant cycle. Do you have any information on a uh, timeline for the rest of phase two, as far as whether or not more grant monies for uh, charging stations might be available after February 8th? And again, you may not know. You know, I do not know that. Okay. I would contact Meshavim and Rahman about that. I will say that in this phase, there is, it's like the 50% of all the money that they're receiving is being distributed during this phase. So they have $23.75 million that they're giving out. I would hope that maybe some more of it is for uh, charging infrastructure, but I, I'm not in the know on that at all. <laughs> okay, sounds good. So Thank I you. just put the I put the link to what's called Minnesota's plan, which is the plan for the Volkswagen settlement dollars into the chat. There's three phases. As she said, we're in phase two right now, which is half of the money. It's 2020 to 2023. There will be a third phase 20, 2024 to 2027 um, that will have $11.75 million. And they each time they do kind of a reach out and ask for feedback as they put together their specific plan for each phase based on kind of how things have gone. It's possible that there will be another um, um, section with some funding for level two chargers and fast chargers. Um, uh, I, I can't recall specifically if there is um, or not, but um, you know, you can look at that, that document and certainly reach out to the MPCA um, about the plans. So it's possible, but if you're thinking about a level two charger, um, I, I, would, I, would, I wouldn't hesitate to apply for the February 8th one. Um, it's gonna be competitive, but it's the most money of the whole, you know, again, half of the money is in phase two. So, um, and yeah, so I would just, I would highly encourage um, folks to do that. But I, I sent, I put in the chat, the, the um, Minnesota's plan about the Volkswagen settlement. And, um, I don't know if Caitlin has anything else that she would add. Nope. Okay. <laughs> All right. Well, it's time for discussion. Um, and, you know, we really um, want to also just do a quick poll. I'm, you know, I'm really uh, curious about whether cities have um, done a fleet study you know, has your city completed a fleet analysis? Um, so we'll put that poll up and see what folks say. And then the second question is, do you feel like you need to do a fleet analysis before you can add an EV? I mean, based on those presentations and our fleet 101 guide, you know, cars that idle a lot, cars that, you know, you're gonna save more money the more it drives, but it needs to fit into a range. I mean, if it's going, 300 miles a day, which I'm guessing not a lot of the city vehicles go 300 miles a day. Um, you know, just really thinking about, you know, is there sort of a no-brainer no based on some of the studies, you know, and some of the learnings from the folks that have done the studies. Um, thankfully for those cities that, you know, went ahead a year, couple of years ago, Excel was willing to pay for those, um, those studies. You know, we, we worked with Excel and they offered it through Cities Charging Ahead. Um, the studies, 
cost around $15,000. I know that Olmsted's was um, a bit more, uh, maybe they had more vehicles, but um, so has your city completed a fleet analysis? I'm guessing that's many of the cities that have, no for, do you feel like you need the analysis? Yes, um, several said no. I, I know that cities often think, you know, their, their circumstances are different, you know, their, their geography, their size, their uses, et cetera. So, um, all right, well, that's um, good to know. Just curious about folks for on the fleet analysis. 70% uh, voted, but there's some of us that are staff that won't vote, so, all right. Um, okay, awesome, thank you. So, you know, here's the discussion part. So, you know, any thoughts from folks about what vehicles do you think could be switched with an EV in your fleet? Like, do you have some vehicles that you can think about like that would be really um, ideal based on what you've heard to be um, switched out? with an EV. And then I really wanna get into, again, my job is to help you um, really, you know, get across the finishing line. So what are the, you know, the current challenges that are still facing your city with regards to um, switching to EVs? Are you facing challenges and what are they? Uh, I, if I could speak to that second question about challenges that we're facing, and this is sort yeah. of an additional question as well. Yeah. Um, we at the city of Oakdale are in discussions about doing a fleet analysis and our fleet manager is part of that discussion. And I think that he's mostly on board. Uh, I would say our city council is a little bit less convinced about the fleet assessment in general and just EVs in, as a whole. Um, so for people who have conducted a fleet analysis, I would be curious to know what section of that report really resonated the most with elected <laughs> officials, or if there's anything else that really uh, caught the attention of your elected representatives that got them to be a little bit more excited about the concept of, of EVs. Thanks. Well, I can say from Faribault's standpoint, Clearly, the, the total cost of operation savings was incredibly important for the council and the administrator and others. So I think being able to show some cost savings, whether it's by eliminating some vehicles or the, you know, just total cost savings of an electric vehicle, I think is really important. But I hope that that's not the only reason why a council is going to be interested in it. I mean, there's so many other reasons, but the economic is super important. Yeah, I would echo that from Olmstead County. The other things that really resonated with them was reducing the size of our motor pool. Um, so, you know, uh, not having a light bulb is better than a light bulb, uh, kind of that philosophy. Uh, it also resonated with them that we could take advantage of our waste energy facility. So because we're in a unique uh, instance where we export that electricity, that really resonated with them. Uh, and then honestly, uh, they are starting to think more about sustainability and things like that. And they felt like this was uh, something that really gets to um, some of those uh, bigger goals uh, without having to close down buildings or, you know, do some, some more dramatic things in our county. Yeah, I mean, that would have been my guess too, is the cost. And, and that's interesting because I was thinking about the replacement, but, you know, reducing the motor pool. So less insurance, less maintenance, let, you know, like all of those things. Um, so there's definitely the economic argument. And then, you know, it depends, you know, if Oakdale has some carbon reduction goals or climate goals or clean energy goals or pollution goals or anything along those lines that also can be a secondary um, piece of it. But I would think that some of those um, elected officials would be um, interested in um, saving taxpayers money. <laughs> I think the other reality that we faced is sometimes as staff, um, electeds don't see us as the experts per se. Um, so it depends on the, the elected officials uh, perception and sometimes bringing in a consultant or an outside agency really helps bolster your um, expertise or, or bolster your um, bolster the information that you can bring back to the, the elected. So that, that's a, a reality that we certainly face. 
Well, and Shannon, I would say you're going to have these PowerPoints. I mean, you could perhaps share some of these slides from Olmstead County, from Faribault. I don't know. I, don't, I wouldn't imagine that yeah. that would make a really big difference between, um, you know, that it was a greater Minnesota city or anything for Oakdale. But the other thing is that, you know, XL Energy, I would, I wouldn't, you know, we could talk about whether, you know, perhaps somebody from XL Energy could speak to it because they're doing all kinds of things with helping cities with their fleets, with, you know, make ready infrastructure. They have a new goal. So that might be the expert that they need um, is somebody from the um, XL um, EV team. All right. Um, anybody else on, you know, kind of challenges? This is uh, John and, and Winona, and uh, I would say one of our one of our challenges is um, we don't have uh, or don't have many dealers or service providers of for electric vehicles in our in our immediate community, and that's and that's turned off our fleet manager from kind of having confidence that we could. If we have to get the vehicles that we could really take care of them and do what we need to to keep them in, in operation and certainly the, the our, our fleet manager is not exactly on board and there's there's just hesitancy there because of the newness and that's uh i think time will time will change that but uh it's not one that i i've been able to to overcome yeah i hear you and and, and i brought this up because during cities charging ahead that was an, an issue duluth you know, face that issue as well. You know, do they have to flat bug, bled a, bed a, tr uh, a an electric vehicle 250 miles to the Twin Cities to get it repaired or whatever? Um, and we can ask Marcus about that two weeks from today um, because I believe that there's some lease options with the, the state and the state contract and that they then cover insurance and maintenance. So um, I think there's some options that can be looked at. And, and then in a lease situation, you know, it's a couple of years, you try it out, it, you haven't gone all in by purchasing it. So, you know, I think a lot of the cities did purchase vehicles, but some did lease their vehicles, their electric vehicles, and that might be a way to stick your toe in, um, you know, uh, for a couple of years to, to lease a vehicle and yeah. um, have, have that maintenance yeah, taken care of. Makes sense. Yeah. Hey, Diana. Yeah, Brandy. Hey, um, I, I I'm in the same exact boat. I have my fleet manager on board, but it's on board only if they can be maintained locally. And we found with the Chevy, local Chevy dealership, that they cannot um, maintain them locally, but they will come pick up the vehicle at our location, drive it to Grand Forks, which is the local, the, the most local dealer that can fix it, and then drive it back to the dealership and return it to our place free of charge. Wow. Yeah. So I didn't know if that was ubiquitous or if that was just a singular thing. That might just be that dealer. Um, it's hard to say, but that's another really interesting concept, you know. Um, and again, it depends on the vehicle. I was going to say, John, you can call the Chevy dealer, but it depends on which vehicle you want to get and what is local and whether they're willing to do that. And I don't know um, from Winona, um, probably Grand Forks isn't the closest one. Right, probably right. No, I, I'm just saying... <laughs> It's yeah. a good two and a half hours, yeah. two hours away from us. Yeah. And that was for, that vehicle is owned by the local power company, uh, yeah. local cooperative. Okay. Yeah. So there's, you know, that's, that's a good thing too. And, and, you know, we did have the dealership um, meeting last fall and, you know, that we're definitely um, trying to do some more outreach and work with dealerships and encourage them to offer electric vehicles, showing that there is demand from both utilities and cities um, across the state. So um, a, a, a bit more of a challenge for greater Minnesota cities than metro cities where there are um, more dealerships here in the Twin Cities that sell and maintain um, electric vehicles. So although I have to say I still get, you know, um, notices from the um, Nissan um, dealer that I bought mine from for oil changes. And I'm like, yeah, I don't really need one. Um, so um, other questions, you know, and maybe if there aren't any more questions about that, um, let's move on to the next question. How so, you know, really the other role that we talked about with that Caitlin talked about at the beginning is that cities really can play a huge role in encouraging and educating 
um, you know, EV growth in your community. Um, you know, we do have a whole toolkit on the, the Drive Electric Minnesota site with website kind of content, newsletter content. We've got EV quizzes that you can use to engage and educate on Twitter or social media or at an event. We have uh, um, education materials. So, and I know there were so many ride and drives planned for 2020 that had to be scrapped. And that was really hard because that is definitely the best way to educate and engage. You know, we um, use the hashtag butts and seats, um, but that is the best way to get somebody to consider purchasing an electric vehicle is if they can sit in one um, and ride one, drive one, ride in one, you know, or better yet drive one. So um, hopefully we'll see ride and drives come back in some way. Um, later the summer or fall, perhaps, um, Drive Electric, National Drive Electric Week is in the fall. That might be a great, um, that might be an opportunity. When I hear maybe live, Fauci said, live music, and for those who don't know me, I love live music, might come back in the fall. So if live music can come back, I'm pretty sure Ride and Drives can. So, you know, how are you, how will you encourage EV growth in your community? How are people doing that? Thanks, Dave. Um, both Dave and Matt have to leave. Thank you so much to them. Really appreciate it. Um, this is Annie from St. Louis Park, along with hosting Topa Ride Drive when that's safe. Something I've been discussing, it's not fully formed yet, but with our Environment and Sustainability Commission, is that one of them um, recently installed an in-home charger. And I was wondering if we could do some sort of like Facebook live event, showing the process of installing the charger, having a QA and a with an owner um, and highlighting all the incentives that Excel, which we're in that territory has um, for those chargers. So kind of trying to think about some virtual ways to engage right now like that. Absolutely, yeah. Um, and real people, stories, um, how they did it, being able to ask questions. Um, you know, and, and all the studies show that, you know, people are most convinced about electric vehicles from their friends and family, people they trust. Um, so, you know, and we did a big social media campaign this fall trying to kind of encourage that and share that. But um, I guess I'll just, you know, end with what additional resources you feel like you need to take action. What else can we do to help? We're here to help. Well, thank you so much, everybody, for being here. We will do a survey at the end of the second meeting of fleets just to get some feedback and get some more information from you about how we can be helpful. We really want to help you be successful and get you know across the finish line. That was what we said we would do. Um, so we're happy to help do that, but you have to tell us how we can help you. So um, thanks again. And just a reminder, next, we'll send this out in the follow-up too, but next slide that um, we'll have our um, sessions on EV readiness as a community and EV standards um, in February on the 11th and 25th. But next week or two weeks from now, Thursday the 28th, we'll have our next meeting about fleets. Um, we have some great speakers and it's really about purchasing. We have a city, um, Jen from Woodbury is going to talk about their vehicles. Um, and um, yeah, don't forget about the VW settlement level two. It's open till February 8th. So thanks everyone.